دیز این اردو پوائم اور اس ورس مغز کو باغ میں جانے نہ دو کہ نہ حق ہوں ایک پروانے کا ہوگا رائٹ آئی ایم سوری ایف یو ڈونٹ انڈرسٹینڈ دیٹ آئی لیٹ می ٹرانسلیٹ دیٹ Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to today's episode of uh, the Islam 21 The Unscripted Podcast. Uh, I'm your host, uh, Salman Bhatt, and my co-host today is the lovely A- Adil. His name's Adil. Say hi, Adil. Oh, is it on? Sorry, yes. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. And with us, we're joined by our brother, uncle, uh, Ustad Adil Rashid. Um, yeah, I think it's Adnan Rashid. I'm Adil. Adil Rashid. He's a cricketer, isn't he? Yeah. Okay. Let's start again. This is Adran Rashid, Ustad Adran Rashid, mashallah. Uh, how was your trip here? Alhamdulillah, very nice. Thank you for inviting me. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. As-salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah ma'abad. Salallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yes. Your voice sounds really nice in these mics, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Mashallah. 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 Has anyone told you you've got a really nice voice? <laughs> anyone. Yeah. Many people. <laughs> Many people. Many <laughs> people. <laughs> mashallah. How was your journey here? My journey was quite... Came all the way from West London to East London. Yes, yes. And I was making Jewish a lot of phone calls on the way, sending messages, talking to people, yeah. sorting a few things out. So Alhamdulillah, it was a very yeah. nice journey. Mashallah. So when you're busy doing something, you don't feel the journey, yeah. the length of the journey. Mashallah, productivity. Mm. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I find it very difficult to read when I'm being driven around. Yeah, It's same just here. I get, get kind of yeah. sick or looking at a phone or something, yeah. so... Yeah. yeah, I find it generally hard to read. <laughs> no, I'm <was> joking. <laughs> We need to get out of that habit of not reading. That's yeah. a really good point to start off with, actually. Mashallah. Yeah. I mean, I've, I, actually, I, we all read. Yeah. What we don't realize is that we read a lot. Uh, and what we're reading is rubbish. Online, mm. Facebook posts, Instagram, and uh, other things. Billboards. Slam, we read billboards. We read, we read, we do read a lot, mm. but we don't read important stuff. That's the problem. Mm. And on average, every single person in the world who uses mobile phones reads yeah. um, two, three pages of a book or equivalent of that. Yeah. But we're reading rubbish, unfortunately. In mm-hmm. most cases, I'm not saying all people are reading rubbish, yeah. but in most cases, we're just reading unnecessary stuff that doesn't really develop your, your mind. It mm. doesn't, doesn't make you think. Yeah, I think uh, that depends also what type of book you read. Because mm. if you've got one of the picture books, then it's a few <laughs> words per page. <laughs> yeah. Pop-up ones. <laughs> you know how I, reali- how I realized this? Uh, yeah. Actually, my son Musa and Ali Dawa, mm. who is also my, like my son, mashallah, both of them, mashallah. I love them daily. Uh, they were having this conversation and Ali was saying to Musa, I, d- I, I can't read. I can't read. And Musa told him, bro, you read a lot. You actually do read. And you are on your phone, maybe... Uh, Eight hours out of, the, mm-hmm. out of the ten hours we spend together. So he said, yeah, you're right. I do read. But I don't, I don't read important enough stuff. So yeah. th- this is a misconception. We all read. We don't read important stuff. Yeah, subhanAllah. I mean, I've been to Adnan's house. And mashallah, his library is huge. <laughs> There, your, your front room, just alone, you had so many books. But then I went upstairs. You showed me some manuscripts of uh, kind of stuff. He's got a big collection. And his bedroom even, like wall to wall, just... Uh, Uh, bookshelves. How many books do you have? Um, uh, easily over 3,000. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And I hope I'm able to read all of them one day. I do <laughs> read chap- I mean, whatever interests me out of those books. And I believe collecting books is um, a hobby every Muslim should aspire mm-hmm. to adopt. Why? Because we were the most bookly people. When we talk about the Muslim civilization, mm. the Muslim civilization was based upon this, um, this notion of um, being bookly. Okay, today we have unfortunately become the most bookless people for some yeah, reason. Is that because we don't read books or is it because we have tablets and we have things to replace the books? So we could have That's partly the reason. books, but in a That's iPad. partly the reason, but generally we have become uh, a bookless people. Uh, Do you part- have a Kindle as well? Um, no. I read, I like to read hard copies. Yeah, I mean, read from you like the feel of the, of the book? And not even the feel, it's, I, I feel more comfortable um, reading a, a, from a hard copy than, than reading online or mm. reading PDFs on the, on the screen. They kind of affect You're you. You're not a PDF man then? Not really, not really unless I am really, I mean, I can't find uh, hard copies, then I, mm. I, I don't mind reading from PDFs. Unless it's a refutation. Yeah, yeah, that's PDF right. Yeah, PDF repetitions. They're very entertaining, so you don't feel the pain, you know. 
So, so yeah, generally, yeah. I think we should definitely, we mm. the Muslims in particular and humans in general, we should go back to reading books, yeah. go, go back to um, reading important information that helps us improve our lives in general so that we can make this world a better place. I think a lot of it is because of um, kind of socioeconomic ish, uh, dynamics as well, because generally in the population, mm. as, uh, there was a program on the radio the other day about how um, the, the further up on the kind of economic scale you go, the more um, children tend to read for enjoyment mm. rather than being forced to do something. Yes. Uh, mm. And it's, uh, some say it's partly because the parents have more time to spend with their kids. They mm. can read to them and, parent, and they, they grow up enjoying that. But mm. if the parents are kind of struggling to make ends meet, then they're going to spend less time reading to the kids and that kind of stuff. Um, and also they mentioned, you know, it, it's, it's very important for building certain skills like empathy, like your imagination skills. I mean, I was talking, I did a, um, a youth event, you know, Night Mania. Um, I shouldn't mention like where exactly that <laughs> I was really kind of saddened to see a lot of the brothers, the kind of young people. They, instead of reading, they play. Lo they, they spend lots of time playing oh. online games and social media, and it, it, you feel like they may be struggling with certain, um, you know, social skills, social, social skills, skills oh. even kind of maintaining eye contact, speaking to someone in real yes. life, mm -hmm. um, that kind of stuff. And it's very sad. Yeah, unfortunately. How do you, how, do you in, how would you encourage, like the next generation, to hold fast to to reading as a for for you know for even as a hobby to to instead of kind of putting on the TV or going to social media and stuff, um, I think parents have to lead the way and they, they 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 must start collecting books, must buying start buying books for your children. Mm. I remember as a child um, when I was not a teenager yet, um, my mum bought me a book, and the fact that she bought me a book had a huge impact on me. I made sure that I read that book. It was on Islamic history. It was a history of the prophets. So and what age were you? What I was, uh, I think I was 12 at the time. She bought me a book. She, she, she specifically bought this book for me. She came home and she said, I bought this mm -hmm. book for you. So <coughs> read it. Where were and you? Which country were you? Where did I was you in Pakistan up? at the time. Grew I, I grew up in Pakistan, yeah. Um, so, so I was read it in Urdu or English? The book was in Urdu. Okay. So my Urdu reading was... Uh, and that book kind of got me going into reading more. It encouraged me. So parents should take the lead. They should encourage mm -hmm. the children to read. And, and not just with words. Facilitate uh, for your children. You know, facilitate uh, an educational environment for them. Give them means uh, or take them to museums personally. Uh, take them to libraries. Uh, borrow books for them. Get them to choose books. So when she gave you the book, hmm. did how, how did that follow through? Because... A lot of parents these days, they'll give, they'll go yeah. back 10 books. Yeah. They'll give the kids 10 books and they say, oh, yeah. read these, look, we bought them, so yeah. present. They value the book, they give the book, but then there's yeah. no follow through after that. Yeah. You see, the thing is, uh, my mum probably doesn't even remember that. She, she, put, you, she I don't think she would remember that particular incident. Um, but I do, because it meant a lot for me as a child. Mm -hmm. When she gave me the book, it was like out of the blue. And uh, I started reading it. And I remember the impact to this day. It's, it's still with me. So these gestures, they, they may be very small gestures, unimportant, insignificant for parents, but they go a long way with children. Mm -hmm. Even a simple advice to a child. Sit the child down, speak to the child seriously, tell the child how the world is, what needs to be done, uh, where you should start give a book to the child say read this book buy simple stuff first because if you if you're buying mm. highly complicated stuff academic studies of uh, you know pipes and and yeah. and maybe you know stars or or, or rockets or something yeah. like that how to Not become that, a doctor yeah, and stuff, yeah 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 <laughs> nothing nothing yeah something interesting right yeah. so the children are kind of uh, more involved in that i've done that with my kids occasionally and it mm. works it works, alhamdulillah. Did so you have a TV in your house with your kids? Of course, up? of course we had a TV. And but in Pakistan, there's only I, like one I, channel. I, I watch no, no, TV. In your house. Yeah, but one of the problems we're facing right now, one of the challenges is the phones mm. and the games within those phones. So, the chil so our children are very, unfortunately, very, very, very much involved in playing these games mm. uh, on their phones. And these games uh, are designed to... Um, hijack their brain chemistry even unfortunately uh, dopamine, dopamine and it seems so. to be working uh, mm. there is very little communication between families uh, 
Kids don't know parents, parents don't know kids because yeah. parents are busy on Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram and kids are busy playing games yeah. and uh, then as they grow their interests change and sometimes they start listening to music and then mm. they start make start making new friendships and mm. those friendships lead them to different things in life so it's very important to have a very strong relationship very very strong relationship so the so parents must assert their authority and limit the time of uh, yeah. children on their phones so and that, even games is that what you did with your kids yes i try my best to do it my kids the younger ones two younger ones they are uh, kind of hooked on these games mm. so i always tell my wife to to cut the time short how and, old are they um they are now uh, my daughter is uh, she's um she was born in 2003 that would make her 16 uh, okay and uh, okay. my son Fitness. the y- younger yeah. one uh, he's uh, he was born in 2006 so mm. that would make him 13, 13. so uh, 16 and 13 both of them mm. are teenagers and i now try to make mm. more time for them to take them out to walk around go to museums just show them stuff talk to them about this stuff look mm. it stimulates their minds it makes them think hold on there is a world outside of these games there is something very important mm. happening out there we need to be part one of one practical it. Yeah. kind of um, piece of advice i think uh, ustad sohail gave was that have every day have a digital sunset mm. so and th- like beyond this time mm. was it sunset or blackout digital mm. sunset so beyond we call it what you want it's not yeah. very important but Beyond like 7 p.m. or whatever. Lockdown. Nobody, hmm. even the parents, hmm. you, you turn off the Wi-Fi, you put all of your... Absolutely good. I, I'm an amazing idea. And have a yeah. real you know, meal yeah. or conversation, especially before you go to bed, it shouldn't be the last thing you see. And I see, I see a real change in their behavior, children's well, behavior. When parents take them seriously, sit them down and have a conversation with them. This conversation can be about mm. plants, stars, trees, carpet, table uh, anything for that matter brexit uh, yeah brexit <laughs> if, if that if if it deserves a discussion okay um, it could be anything but the kids they start to realize hold on we have a family mm. we have parents who care for us they want to talk to us and you see them you see the real them coming out they start talking they start expressing themselves they start to feel the relationship mm. and unfortunately what's happening nowadays in this current day and age we have been affected by this severely our children do not have a strong relationship with the parents. They are making virtual friends online, yeah. whether it's in the form of the games and the people they play games with, or you know, people they communicate with uh, on WhatsApp it's so, and Snapchat. It's so, um, yeah. it's so kind of, uh, as a parent, it's very attractive to and almost irresistible not to give your child something and then just leave me alone. Hmm. A lot of people say hmm. that, you know, that if you give them a tablet or put yeah. something on TV, yeah. you get some, you know, yeah. um, the parents or the mother, or, mm. you know, if she's mm. stuck in the house, mm. she'll get some time to herself, you know. So it's very, yes. very difficult to mm. overcome that kind of, um, that, you know, uh, allure of... So how do your kids deal with, you know, mashallah, that you're in the spotlight... You're out and about, your speaker's corner, mashallah, Musa now as well is in the spotlight. Does that have an impact on your other kids? Do they uh, see that? Do they want to The be only impact my kids are facing at the moment is my absence. Uh, mm. I, I'm absent from home for long periods. I'm gone for weeks uh, doing events uh, internationally. And sometimes I feel um, that I'm not giving enough time to them. And, uh, and it really uh, does kind of affect me. But I try to make up. Uh, for it when I get back I spend time with them I try to talk to them I want to take them out and mm. uh, it's, it's not easy unfortunately but it can be done and I'm working on it but that's one of the struggles I have uh, the absence uh, oh. but they're not very young uh, fortunately when they were young I had plenty of time at home okay, and, and now they say the young years are yeah, the most now they are older yeah. for, for the <laughs> last three four years I've been very busy so it hasn't really impacted them. They do, f- they do miss me. They message me that we're missing you, want you to come back. And they feel this sense of security when I'm at home. You know, yeah, the alpha sure. male uh, mm. uh, is at home. Mufasa, <laughs> uh, Mufasa, <laughs> Mufasa is in the living room, you know, or Mufasa is in the toilet yeah. upstairs. Yeah, or Mufasa is in the bedroom, okay? Um, so it's that kind of feeling, you know? Uh, the little Simbas, you yeah. know, they, so it's, it's that kind of thing. Um, they feel this sense of security, which is very important for kids to feel. And I believe this is why, uh, you know, broken families um, impact uh, the well-being of children uh, uh, to a high degree. You know why? Mm. Because children, they, don't, they lose that sense of security. 
and mm. uh, it's a very important so thing. So for for like a younger imams, du'at and stuff that mm. are kind of th- their families are young, would you suggest to them that they kind of not go on the kind of global tours for long ex- extended periods and whilst their kids are still that that young age? You see, it's it's not about quantity; it's about quality. Mm. As long as they have a very strong going relationship uh, mm. with their children, uh, whereby they have uh, a very uh, you know strong communication going on uh, whether it's whatsapp whether bond, it's phone yeah. calls or whether it's the presence in person mm. um, as long as they have that with the children then it shouldn't really affect uh, the absence from home but uh, th- i believe the younger the children uh, the, the the better the the prospect of um, having a stronger relationship because when they, when they tend to get older uh, mm. you you know you tend to um, you know, find this distance between yourself and your child, which is natural, right? Because obviously, yes. when they're younger, you're looking after them. You can spend a lot exactly. more time with them. Exactly. When they're getting older, they want to yeah. find themselves. They're going to grow older. They're yeah. going to have their own decisions. They want yeah. a bit of space, etc. So you want to build those bonds yeah. when they're younger. Yeah. So I, I advise that give your children priority. They are your asset. They are mm. your future. Your true legacy are mm. your children. Give as much time, quality time, as possible to them. And as long as there's quality, quantity wouldn't really impact uh, the, the the bigger picture. Mm, so surely. it's very important to talk to your children, to sit with them, <coughs> to look them in the eye and say, "Listen, whatever problems you may be facing, whether it's uh, it's um, uh, you know whether it's something at school, college, on the street, where within yourselves, where you're feeling down, talk to me. I want you to talk to me, so that." you can solve the problems and uh, mm. children find strength in their parents parents must realize and if children come with problems don't wish them away don't uh, have a go at them don't blame them for the problems they may be having they are innocent they are young they are tender and if you push them away if you wish them uh, like people parents say uh, mm. how did you even end up in this situation you know no blame game you shouldn't you should help your child overcome the troubles and i'm i'm going through that every single day i'm a father Okay, mm. every single child has a unique issue, so you have to deal with it. So mm. you should be there always for them. They should see you as your as their strength, not as the backbone. Yeah, ex- exactly, exactly. Yeah. 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 So what got you into into studying history? Was that that book that your mother gave when you were twelve, or oh, that, something else? That happened? that helped uh, um, to to an extent. Uh, that helped to to gain interest in history in general. Mm. Uh, but there were a number of things. When I was growing up, uh, I was more into uh, learning about Muslim figures, for example. I would read novels, historic novels, and they kind of stimulated my interest into re- uh, you know, reading more about Muslim figures. Like Again, is this in the Urdu medium? Urdu, Urdu, Urdu yeah. mainly Urdu, because I started with Urdu. Yeah. And... Um, I was whereabouts, re- wh- whereabouts in Pakistan were you raised? I was raised in mainly in Islamabad, the capital, um, mm. and I've spent few couple of years in the village as well. And so you have a strong connection. Obviously, you were brought up in Pakistan. Yes. So do you yes. identify yourself? I, I think as like a Pakistani. A pa- you think like a Pakistani? Yeah, my I'm okay. I think like a Pakistani. Okay. Okay. I don't know what that means. <laughs> okay. People, 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 I don't either. People, but okay. People, people people can take the uh, take from that whatever they want. Okay. But my mind, uh, my sense of humor, and dream, the language I think, or, 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 or the language I swear in. Yeah. 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 My language is Urdu, basically, and that's the language you speak at home. So I was primarily reading in Urdu. Um, I was 19 when I came to the UK in 1997. So I had been th- through college and, and, and school, and my university was here, of course. Which uh, university did you go to? I went to the University of London. Uh, okay. b- uh, did my bachelor's at uh, Birkbeck, and then did my master's at SOAS, and I'm now pursuing further studies. What did you do in your bachelor's? History. History. history and then history and history. history yes okay yes, sure. yes. I and love it history. will be history <laughs> yes <laughs> inshallah the thing about history the, yeah. the, you know uh, every year there's just more of it yes absolutely <laughs> yes exactly that's right and and it's ge- it gets more interesting the more you learn about it the the better it gets and it teaches you so much um, amazingly the quran yeah. one of the strongest arguments allah presents in the quran to teach lessons is history 
How many examples of Allah? Alam tara kayfa wa'ala rabbuka bi'ad iramadat al-imad allati lam yukhlak mithluha fil bilad hal ataka hadithu Musa alam tara kayfa wa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al-fil So Allah is giving the examples a story of Dawud al-Islam Suleiman and other prophets Isa al-Islam um, so the purpose is to teach you lessons Surah Baqarah uh, talks about Banu Israel at yes. length and the purpose is to highlight points to to avoid pitfalls mm-hmm. okay and to repeat uh, virtues if there is something virtuous about history it needs to be repeated mm. you know a lot of our parents the i mean about my generation they discourage learning or studying history in those kinds of humanities they're like no no you have to be a doctor engineer scientist or accountant or something Yeah. Practical and that's. I think that was a. That's a bit of a disaster. Uh, like yeah. you, mashallah, you became a doctor, <laughs> mashallah. I saw saving lives, lives every day, right? Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know. Uh, so, what was your doctorate <laughs> again? <laughs> He's a doctor. Just <laughs> that's, that's all you need to know. <laughs> well, like uh, like Sheikh Haytham says, you know, he says we 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 pushed our children to become rule followers, not rule or kind rule of discourse makers. producers. Yes. And um, my agree. cousin, he uh, found out he did. He he chose history as a um, as a degree mm. to the kind of protest of his parents. I was like thinking, Alhamdulillah, trying to explain to them that this is really mm. this is mm. really powerful and important for us to you know put our, our young people towards. But it, it's hard to pay the bills, though. That's the problem. And that's a realistic. That's a, that's a misconception. Problem. That's a mis- that's what people say. People think that they're going to send their kids into law, into medicine, into accountancy, and that that will pay bills no mm. that that may depress the child the child doesn't want to do it yeah. Yeah. yeah and the child may end up failing uh, because of that choice made on his or her behalf there was a funny meme i came across on facebook there was a child newly born child and um there was a meme that okay you will be an engineer and the child is responding bruv i was only born five minutes ago <laughs> <laughs> and you already made the choice for me and this is exactly how it is unfortunately yeah, yeah. parents choose for children as to what what they should do and so that, that was traditional in the last generation but do you think it is in our generation growing up after going through that experience hmm. that with our kids when they grow up will actually be a bit more um, open or will we be the same and just tell them you know what we've been through it stick to medicine become a doctor become a dentist hmm. become an engineer there's nothing wrong with that as long as you 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 make a commitment to yourself that this is only for a, a, a career uh, to make money to oh, earn oh. a living okay uh, primarily i believe it should be due to passion if you have a passion for medicine and you want to serve humanity that way then it's a, it's a beautiful thing to do it's a, but if you're doing it only for money to get a job so then you end up doing wrong things this is why people mm. you know when uh, uh, they don't have ethics with education uh-huh. then it's a recipe for disaster and people start doing immoral things when they are doctors lawyers uh, consultants or uh, accountants because they didn't really want to do it they didn't want to serve humanity the intention f- from the beginning was wrong this is something that comes from parents parents don't necessarily think that way unfortunately nowadays did you get to any hmm? any kind of um, careers guidance to your kids Um, what, was, what was your kind of messaging to become them? a YouTube star? My father, <laughs> no, not really. None, none of that was planned. And uh, my father uh, wa- wanted me to do business. He wanted me to be a businessman. He always mm. instilled that um, because he lived a very difficult life as a as, as a child. Um, and those days were quite tough for people. And because he had seen that life, he wanted us to to overcome financial difficulties. so he wanted me to indulge in business as for my mother she was encouraging uh to study the conventional way okay she uh-huh. does to this day okay. the conventional way is going to school waking up seven o'clock in the morning which is torture for a child okay so and i used to hate going to school i used to hate so going to school so the hours in pakistan are different right so you go earlier yeah. and you finish earlier in the afternoon no yeah two o'clock one, two, yeah. Two, two, about, yeah one or two o'clock half one in in, in summer and two o'clock in winter i think something like that i don't even remember mm-hmm. so i went to school um you blocked it out of your memory yeah that's I how bad it was <laughs> that's, that's a really bad part of my memory yeah. you know going to school it was like prison okay although schools tend to be different in pakistan i went to good schools i went to what they call in the english medium schools for some reason they have more they have a better impression in in people's minds all all pe- everyone wants their child yeah. uh, to go to an english medium school i don't know why 
Uh, but that's the case in Pakistan. Uh, it's because the Urdu is stronger in the school, right? Uh, no, because <laughs> no, no. <laughs> because Urdu medium schools are ten. You know, they people look down upon them. Yeah, okay, yeah. what what are these people going to do? They are seen as Pendu. Pendu is yeah. like a villager or someone backward kind Peasants. of thing. Yeah. So if you speak English in Pakistan, you can be uh, part of cracker being part of the elite. Uh, yes. Later on in yes. Life. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. So it opens doors for you. Mm. So I went through that schooling for twelve years, and when I look back now. Um, I passed all those exams. So my uh, GCSE equivalent was is called metric in Pakistan. Yeah. Then my A level equivalent. Short for matriculation. Uh, yeah, something like <laughs> that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I actually didn't know that <laughs> until <laughs> very recently. Until very yeah, okay. recently, it was called metric. Okay, metric. Yeah, okay, metric. Okay, I didn't even know. I did FSE. I passed FSE. Okay. Wallahi, to this day, I don't know what it, what that means. To this day, I don't know what that stands <laughs> for. Foundation in science. I know B A B A and B S C stands Are you making for this bachelor's. Up? Yeah. 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 It's like A-level equivalent, isn't yeah, it? It's, yeah, it's but I don't know what that means, yeah. right? This shows you. The, so, <laughs> so but you passed. I, what does A-level mean? Passed. I passed. But yeah. the problem I have with that education system is that it is it doesn't help the child. I, so how did that affect you when you when you were the parent and your kids were now? I basically it. rebelled against that education system. Okay. And my theories may be unconventional. I don't want to use the word radical because of the <laughs> connotations it may come with today. Yeah, uh, my theory on education is unconventional. Okay, I don't like this colonial educational system which was imposed upon us mm. um, by the colonial rule, and we adopted it as uh, revelation from Allah. Mm. Okay. We need but to go didn't it give to suit to you though when you grew up that you went to a Pakistani school? If you had gone to a school in the West, maybe you would have been a lot less um, astute to maybe some of the things you are today. I, I don't think so. The education system is the same. The system is the same. The curricula, the curriculum is quite similar. So, if you were to put my mat, maths book today in front of me, mathematics, mm-hmm. which I passed mm. r- 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 with relatively good numbers, good marks, mm-hmm. right? I will fail. I passed it. I went through that system. I do not remember a word from my books I covered in my GCSE yeah. equivalent or A level. Because the yeah. uh, the schooling system hmm. was made to produce um, workers to serve the industrial revolution. Exactly. Convey belts. Of exactly. Work. So I call. I call. This is for right, rightly so. I called once in one of my public speeches in Pakistan. I called the system poultry farm. Yeah. And they were like, wow, what? <laughs> yeah, I said, because chicks are being produced, they come out of eggs and they're put, they put through a system <laughs> and then the cycle is running non-stop. Yeah. Okay, and this is exactly what it is. It's not producing leaders. Where are your leaders? Oh, if your schooling yeah. system is powerful, it's, if it's producing intellectuals, leaders, scholars, morally upright uh, individuals, where are they? So if Pakistani education, education system is producing all those people, where are they? Unfortunately, we don't have that leadership in the world, and it's never too late. So that's why I, I highlight this issue every time in, uh, I'm in Pakistan, uh, mm. in my public appearances, that we as Muslims generally, and Pakistanis in particular, because I'm speaking in Pakistan, should take the lead, or in Bangladesh, or in, in, in Algeria, or Morocco, or any Muslim country for that matter, we need to think global, mm. right? Where are our Muslim leaders when it comes to uh, defending um, uh, you know the wildlife, for example. Okay, I wasn't expecting that one. That yeah, 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 yeah. This is I'm serious I about. You're going to say Uyghurs, yeah. Uyghurs. No, 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 no. We, this is this is this is where we have lost the plot. We keep mm. crying about human catastrophes that are taking place around the world, which is fine, which is fine. But these human catastrophes are taking place because we are not looking at uh, other major issues that need our attention immediately. For example, okay, elephant poaching in Africa. Mm. On a, on daily basis. Okay, okay. Yeah. I just need to stop you there because we just need to put this into into perspective. Because right. what could be, I could assume what you're saying is, yeah, you know, it's great we're causing the fuss about the issues happening to our brothers and sisters. Yeah, but we need to focus on elephants. Someone might turn around and go, "No, no, are you serious? Come on." Yeah, human life is going. Hmm. Once that's fixed, then hmm. we'll focus on the animals and focus on everything else. Or are you saying we or should I be think. thinking? With everything that's, into that's perspective. That's to be taken for granted. I, yeah. I believe when we look at uh, minor things, what you deem minor, uh, major things will never take place. They okay, will never excellent. happen. Right. Okay, this, is my, this yeah. is my point. Good. Yeah. So if you start looking at, for uh, let's say, if you, uh, 
دیز این اردو پوائم اور اٹس ورس مغز کو باغ میں جانے نہ دو کہ نہ حق ہوں ایک پروانے کا ہوگا رائٹ آئی ایم سوری ایف یو ڈونٹ انڈرسٹینڈ دیٹ آئی لیٹ می ٹرانسلیٹ دیٹ لیٹ می ٹرانسلیٹ دیٹ آئی نو واٹ دا ورڈ مین بٹ آئی نو واٹ دے مین ٹوگیدر دا پوائنٹ سیڈ ڈو ناٹ لیٹ اے بی گو ان ٹو دا گارڈن بیکاز اے موتھ ول ڈائی ان وین سو واٹس دا کنیکشن اف بی دا بی گوئنگ ان ٹو دا گارڈن اینڈ اے موتھ ڈائنگ بیکاز دا پوائنٹ از میکنگ اے کنیکشن بٹوین دا بی uh going to the garden taking juice from the flower coming back to the hive producing wax from wax will come a candle the candle will burn a moth will come and sacrifice itself on the candle on on light right that's so deep. the point that's is making deep. that connection so deep. prevention is the mother of cure yeah, so if the bee prevention is in bee, looking at minor issues but if the bee doesn't get the pollen then the yeah. bees will die and if the bees die it's all well, an issue well you're getting it's into the cycle the, of life the, you see point this is why points talk in Come. metaphors right this is not act- actual yeah. he's not saying don't let the bees live he's saying yeah, I'm a bit of a he's making a point he's making a point <laughs> he doesn't believe in chaos okay <laughs> <laughs> i do i do <laughs> we too much so so the point is if we start looking into like the, look we the muslims yeah. we shouldn't be in this place in the first place we shouldn't be in this condition we shouldn't be in this state we have to mm. where we have to talk about kashmir palestine rohingya mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and 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 what's happening in china with the uyghurs and all that you know why we ended up in this state because we forgot about um um closer you know issues closer to home for example uh, our families okay taking care of our kids educating them producing leaders well, out of them i was just right? uh, reading a message actually yeah. from uh, mm. the islamic council of europe they sent it on their facebook page mm. it was about if you can't unite your family mm. then how can you not do more yes you can't absolutely absolutely if you can't run a family properly and you're talking about khilafa you're talking about uh, ruling a country you're talking about you're giving fatwas on militaries around the world you're giving fatwas mm-hmm. on how governments uh, communicate uh, at the un mm-hmm. for example and every single muslim person you meet uh, um, in a discussion unfortunately is a philosopher political mm-hmm. philosopher mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. but when it comes to when you look at their home the sofa is ripped the the carpet is dirty the toilet is broken the ch- child is on the street selling drugs or something like that unfortunately mm. so where i mean f- stop talking about palestine kashmir i mean not that we shouldn't we should talk about the solutions we have cuz i was going to ask yeah. you a question yeah. about no no we're coming to that yeah. we will definitely talk about that but i'm saying there are things we are ignoring neglecting that are closer to us we have more power to fix those things mm-hmm. exactly. than we do uh um, you, then we so it's like the yeah. circle of influence compared to your circle of Concern. concern concern or ambitions or aspirations or whatever uh, you know you mm. want to put it under so mm. that's why i talk about uh, you know when muslims start to take leadership uh, and uh, on all fields in the world okay where we are supposed to be taking le- leadership for example allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the quran in surah al-anbiya wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alamin a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alamin allah told the prophet that we have sent you not except as a mercy for the worlds the word the, the the word here is words it's not uh only the muslims only the kashmiris only the palestinians only the rohingyas words means anything that mm-hmm. exists on this planet uh, that mm-hmm. you can reach yeah. anything okay. that you uh, anything you have uh, have uh, influence on for example mm-hmm. right so <clears throat> when it comes to uh protecting whales for example elephant poaching or endangered species in yeah. in in Pakistan in Australia in Bra- Brazil in the Amazon we'll jungle begin to take your stewardship of the earth more seriously exactly absolutely yeah. we need to be seen on climate you know for example climate change where are the muslims what yeah. are the most muslims are crying about their little you know things here and there and we, this is why we we ended up with these, these if we produce leadership who's taking the leadership on these issues mm. i just mentioned who's who's taking predominantly non muslims for white non muslim uh you know either on, europeans on, americans on, canadians on australians yeah. it's it's, yeah. it's predominantly white people which yeah. is great good for them i mean this is something good great mm-hmm. about uh people from the west right that's why they don't have to face all these major catastrophes around the world i believe their mm-hmm. home is uh, uh, you know they have a level of justice yes. to the earth yeah and to those people around yeah. them which is maybe protecting them from the same things although a lot of this destruction was caused by colonial powers there's no yeah. doubt i mean the wildlife destruction was caused by colonial pa- caused by colonial oh, powers oh, you know colo- yeah exactly capitalism is one thing but colonial rule in africa and india mm-hmm. you know they simply wiped out the wildlife because they would go for fun 
to shoot down tigers, elephants, uh, uh, buffalo, uh, lions. Native human beings even. Uh, yeah, <laughs> e- e- exactly, native human beings as well. But it's never too late to wake up. Now, mm. uh, something has happened. Uh, things have changed in the 20th century. People woke up. Mm. Hold on. We have a responsibility towards this wrong we have done to the world. We need to fix it. Mm. And they, a lot of people have come forward. They've taken responsibility. My question is, where is the Muslim manifestation of mercy? Allah has made us the manifestation of that mercy he promised in the Quran. Uh-huh. But Prophet Sallallahu passed away 14 uh-huh. centuries ago, right? Uh-huh. We are that manifestation. We are to be that manifestation. Once we start campaigning on these issues, then what do you think? People who are campaigning for elephants, they won't campaign for Palestine? They won't campaign for Kashmir? They won't, of course they will. It is but natural for people to feel... Uh, a and sense of priority, making, a sense of responsibility yeah. towards these global issues. The reason why people are so sluggish and, and, and ignorant or negligent about these causes, these major causes we talked mm-hmm. about, is because they don't look at these not-so-important issues. It's kind mm-hmm. of um, uh, like uh, an argument, min bab al So like, oh. if, like Allah says, don't say yes to your parents. Yes. So it encompasses anything greater than that. Absolutely. So if, you're, if your concern is even injustice towards animals yeah. or the environment, yeah. anything then above that you're going to be yeah. hypersensitive towards any w- bigger injustice. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Amazing yeah. point. Look at yeah. the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's telling us there was a sinner from Banu Israel, a woman. Baghiyun min Baghaya Banu Israel. Mm. She mm. was sent to Jannah. She was forgiven mm. by Allah for one kind gesture towards a dog. She descended into a well, she gave uh, little water, this dog dying of thirst uh, next to the well. Mm -hmm. She saw the dog, she felt mercy for the dog, she descended Mm -hmm. into the well, she gave that water. She may have committed major sins. She may have done big things in her life because the the way Prophet described her, Baghiyun min Bagaya Bani Israel, right? Mm -hmm. But Allah forgave her for that kind gesture. So these kind gestures towards animals, the Prophet also talked talked about not burdening the camel because one, so, when you will burden the camel, you'll burden you will people. burden humans, yes. right? Yeah. And when you will burden humans, you will start killing them. It's not far. Like you mentioned, mm. the right of parents in the Quran, mm. Allah talks about wabil walidaini ihsana, right? Mm. So if you are disrespectful towards your parents, the next uh, in line is the Prophet himself, mm. and then Allah. The Quran and all these things—you're not—you're not far from that. This is why Allah Subhanahu wa Taala draws these lines. Don't cross these lines. Okay, once you cross one line, the next line is not far. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You see, mm-hmm. so this is why we need to start looking at the 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 planet. Uh, we the Muslims need to have a bird's eye view of the planet. We don't. We, it, once we start focusing on exhausting our our, our means and our uh, you know finances on one particular cause. Uh, because it's a human catastrophe, uh, which is the right thing to do. Yeah. But we need some people to focus on other things as well, yeah, yeah. so that we can take global leadership, yeah. which is, different belongs to us anyway. Yeah, becoming leaders mm-hmm. in different yeah. spheres. Yeah. 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 yeah, which belongs to us for the reasons described in the Quran, that mm-hmm. we are the best of people. Why? Because, not because we have a certain color, a certain language, a certain tribe or, or, or a background. No, because of our characters. Because yeah. we, we deserve leadership if mm-hmm. we... Uh, you know, uh, good yeah, exactly. Good stand up to it, yeah. okay, or mm-hmm. stand up for it. Yeah, that's a good point. I wanted also to ask you a few questions about your thoughts on the, the recent escalations in uh, Kashmir because mm. you've been um, making some statements about it on social media and uh, particularly looking at the, the history of, you know, I remember one of your Facebook posts you mentioned that um, the founders of Pakistan, hmm. um, they kind of foresaw, hmm. they predicted that there would be a rise in right-wing Hindu nationalism. Hmm. So that's one of their reasons you know, behind campaigning for a state for, for Muslims. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, I didn't know that. I mean, what was... Um, so, I mean, so just let's just... Uh, recently, there's been an acute escalation uh, of rhetoric and they're, they're, um, in, in India... Mm. Uh, against the Kashmiris, there, there's been a sense of panic. A few mm. brothers and sisters we've been talking about uh, over there in Kashmir, in, in, in India as well, have been talking about you know the very precarious situation they're feeling. Can you describe what what's been happening, and then maybe we can look at the. the you history. see, uh, to understand what's happening uh, happening in India today, one must study the history of India from ancient times, like mm. going back to maybe at least a thousand years back. 
to start studying what was happening in India then, mm -hmm. right? Um, and why did the Muslims feel this sense of uh, fear from the extreme uh, element within the Hindu community in India? Uh, so because Muslims had uh, existed or coexisted in uh, India with Hindus for over a thousand years, right? So uh, they had good reasons, solid reasons to fear living under a Hindu rule in India, especially when it would be a democracy when the British left, uh, because Hindus were the majority. And this argument that Muslims uh, from Bengal and uh, West, uh, Western India and Central India collective, uh, collectively would have outnumbered the, the current Hindu majority of India is absurd. This argument is absolutely absurd. Oh, yeah, anyone who knows the demographics, times, I didn't know if it was well yeah, long, anyone yeah. who knows the demographics uh, of India wouldn't argue in that way. Why? Because what has changed today? There are more Muslims in India uh, than there are in Pakistan, and they are demographically divided in ways that they cannot have a real impact politically uh, on the politics of the country. So. Now, if you look at the Muslim population in India, it's, it, it, it is in pockets. There is a pocket in Hyderabad, mm -hmm. there's a pocket in uh, uh, northern India, there are a few mm -hmm. pockets um, possibly in West India. Okay? And because they are divided demographically, uh, they cannot have a real impact politically. How many MPs do Muslims have in the parliament in India today? How many? How mm -hmm. many real leaders who can actually stand and t talk for Muslims. There is one or two, there are one or two people, of course, uh, there is, uh, these are these Oasi brothers who are seen as villains by the, the extremist uh, element in India. Uh, but they are trying their best to represent the Muslim mm -hmm. cause in India, right? So this argument, is, this is why the founding fathers of Pakistan demanded a separate homeland in order to protect uh, the unique identity Muslims professed. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, Muslims were different to Hindus, of course. Uh, Muslims, uh, was although Hindu it, hmm. a coherent kind of no group? Because uh, I, I, I get the impression see, sometimes that yeah. Hinduism as a thing was created, uh, kind of stringing together all Hindu, kinds of Hinduism is a new idea. Yeah. Hindus are not homogeneous. They're not monolithic. They yeah. don't exist Ooh. as a pocket, as one uh, united entity. Th that was never the case. If you pick up uh, histories from the Mughal period and mm. even before that, they are written in Persian, mm. even written by Hindus, even written so by who Hindus. who created Hinduism? Uh, Hinduism was created by the British, okay, to divide okay. the Muslims and Hindus uh, along com uh, religious lines mm. so that they are easily governed. And uh, the British uh, uh, establishment, colonial establishment, favoured uh, Hindus over Muslims because they feared that Muslims who have lost power in India will try to come back to, to, to mm. or they will try to claim back that glory once they once had in India. So that was the reason why uh, the British political establishment favoured Hindus and Hindus were appointed in important positions even in the mm. 19th century. So the, the war of independence or the Indian mutiny uh, of 1857 yeah. Um, Depending who you ask. Uh, yeah. Exactly, absolutely. De depends on perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, uh, caused the Muslims to be marginalized. They were completely sidelined uh, because the British blamed the Muslims entirely for that mutiny, even though it was sparked or initiated by Hindus. The Hindu garrison at Meerut in India in 1857, it was actually started by a Hindu uh, soldier within the British East India Company, um, mm. army. His name was Mangal Pandey and he initiated the rebellion and it then, then it grew to other regions of northern India and then the Mughal emperor who was a puppet already uh, anyway mm. was forced into it by on mm. gunpoint. Some of these mutineers they came and they occupied Delhi and they forced the emperor to take leadership because they didn't have a leader. They didn't have a leader so they wanted mm. some kind of central leadership. So the blame was put on Muslims, cut, to cut the long story short, and Muslims were thenceforth completely marginalized from important positions. Mm. They were given to Hindus, uh, Muslims lacked education. For that reason, people like Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, uh, who had some erroneous ideas on Islam, unfortunately, he you know, kind of sparked many controversies when it comes to his theological views. But when it comes to his leadership for the Muslim community in India, he was very sincere. He wanted good for the Muslims. So for that purpose, to that end, he established this uh, college called 
Anglo Muslim College in a place called Aligarh which later mm-hmm. on and no came to be known as the Aligarh University the Oxford of Muslim mm-hmm. in India basically mm-hmm. right and the Aligarh University produced many intellectuals because he could see sir sayed could see sir sayed his name was sayed ahmad khan uh, okay. sir was the title given by the british mm-hmm. establishment to to him for his achievements right so he could see that muslims if something is not done very fast will uh, suffer financially economically you know politically Uh, and that will impact muslim well being in india so that's why he established this educational institution to have an elite for the muslim uh, community so that muslims can have effective leaders intelligent leaders educated leaders who can mm. lead the uh, lead the muslims of the subcontinent yeah. okay. and that yes. is what produced directly or indirectly that particular group of people um, which rose to lead the muslims during the independence movement later mm. on in the okay so then how does kashmir century. how does kashmir kashmir issue is basically uh, another a very unfortunate episode in the history of colonial india uh, kashmir is predominantly muslim yeah, right okay. kashmir was governed by muslims for over a thousand years again uh, muslim uh, sultans uh, had direct rule over kashmir okay In fact, we can find coins to this day uh, from the Mughal period minted in Kashmir. In Srinagar, mm-hmm. you have um, uh, the Mughal Emperor Jalaluddin Muhammad Akbar. Mm-hmm. Um, his coins were minted in Srinagar. Oh, okay. wow. I, I, I possess them in my personal uh, mm. coin. By, by the way, I'm a coin collector as well. Oh, yeah. You missed that oh. out. Okay. Yeah, so I have a huge coins collection, uh, mainly focusing on Muslim dynasties, Muslim civilization, and okay, then other sure. um, regions as well. What's the oldest coin you have? Sorry? Mm, Umayyad? No, Greek. Um, Greek. 5th okay. century BC. <laughs> Athens. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Srinagar. There are coins minted in Srinagar. Then we have uh, coins minted during so the reign of a, Jahangir, mm, Shah Jahan, Aurangzeb. I okay. possess, I, I have these coins in my personal collection. Oh, wow. Okay. Mm-hmm. What's your address? Minted in Kashmir. <laughs> Kashmir. <laughs> Sorry? What's your address? <laughs> my address is unknown. Actually, I don't keep all my coins in one place, by the way. If uh, anyone's uh, thinking something. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Uh, so anyone who collects coins seriously yeah. would know that much <laughs> okay so yeah, i must admit i just collect coins for kind of spending them okay <laughs> but you can't do that anymore because they don't have any value it's yeah. unfortunate so kashmir has been there okay. as muslim territory for a very long time mughal emperors would go there for uh, you know uh, rec- recreational purposes they would okay. go and spend their time there if if, if, if an emperor felt Uh, sick or ill they would make their way to kashmir i mean there are so many examples then after the moguls declined um, other dynasties came in for example the duranis the afghans right okay. ahmad shah abdali um, or also known as ahmad shah durani uh, he governed kashmir directly there are coins was that after the moguls after the moguls okay. after the moguls it was before the moguls so how did how was kashmir lost from mm. i mean how did muslims lo- lose control of kashmir which is predominantly muslim demographically kashmir is a muslim territory okay i would say over 80% of the, the, the population is muslim right so when india was divided by the british uh, colonial establishment kashmir would naturally come to pakistan, pakistan right but kashmir was a semi independent territory ruled by uh, hind a hindu family called the dogras okay this hindu family got the the control of uh, kashmiri territory in the mid 19th century from the sikhs mm. because maharaja ranjit singh uh, again is going to be a very long history lesson I'm, and i'm going to shorten it uh, so that people understand yeah. where we're coming from uh, sikhs um, uh, governed parts of india particularly punjab the punjab region for nearly 50 years okay mm. uh, maharaja ranjit singh who was born in current day pakistan gujranwala okay uh, he rose to unite or oh, he took leadership as uh, as a young man of the sikh uh, divided uh, military orders he united them there were 12 uh, different orders in different parts of punjab okay of the sikhs and they called them mithils mithil actually means a group uh, okay, of yeah. people who are it's like a military group so they would go into different territories rob plunder and this is how they lived 
right? So Ranjit Singh united all these 12 groups and became the leader. And he took Lahore from the Duranis. Okay. Oh. So after he occupied Lahore in 1799, uh, thenceforth he governed uh, with an iron fist parts of Punjab. And at one point he was governing territory from Peshawar to Multan. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yes. Uh, and he governed for 40 years. He died in 1839. Cut the long story short. Mm -hmm. Within 10 years, his empire uh, was uh, dismantled. And there were two Anglo-Sikh wars. The British had their eyes on the Punjab, which is a very fertile yes, region. Very fertile. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it was producing... Uh, Rice, sugar, a, potatoes. A lot of things. So, a lot of things. Yeah. so the British had their eyes on the Punjab. So they defeated the Sikhs in two wars, two Anglo-Sikh wars, and the Sikhs lost the influence in Punjab, and the British uh, imposed their direct rule. Now, at that time, uh, Kashmir was governed by the Sikhs, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Kashmir was occupied by Maharaja Ranjit Singh, and there are coins minted in Kashmir in the name of Maharaja Ranjit Singh and his sons, Sher Singh and you know others who came. I mean, there were not many. Unfortunately, they all kind of died within a very short span of time after their father was uh, mm -hmm. gone. So Kashmir became a territory ruled by the Sikhs. But then the governor of Kashmir was Hindu. His name was Gulab Singh. Okay, uh, Gulab Singh was directly attached to the court of Maharaja Ranjit Singh in Lahore. So when uh, things went wrong, uh, upside down in the center, Gulab Singh uh, announced his independence mm -hmm. and they came to be known as the Dogras. Okay, this okay. was the Dogra family. So there was now direct rule of the Dogras mm -hmm. um, over they, they the valley of they, Jammu and Kashmir. Which okay. is predominantly Muslim population. Population is still Muslim. Okay. Dominantly, over 90% is still Muslim. Okay, so uh, from then to 1940s, when India was basically split into two halves mainly, um, the, the, the family still continued to govern, even as, um, as a tributary uh, power. Uh, I mean, they, they were like under the protection, or you know, how can I put it? It was like a vessel state, yeah. right? So the over ruling power was the British colonial okay. establishment. So Maharaja or the Raja of Kashmir at the time of the partition was Hari Singh, one of the descendants of Gulab Singh. Mm -hmm. uh, Jinnah approached him for the reason that Muhammad Ali Jinnah, Muhammad Ali Jinnah approached yeah. him in 1947 or before that, that Kashmir is a Muslim territory. It, the population is all Muslim. So it would be only fair for you to join Pakistan, right? And uh, then Nehru Pandit Jawaharlal uh, Nehru, who was the, the leader on the other side, who was representing Congress, uh, Congress party mm -hmm. in India, who was one of the founding fathers of current day India, uh, he approached um, Maharaja Hari Singh that you should um, uh, become a part of India. So with some reservations, because he was Hindu himself, Hari Singh, he didn't care about the population, and in fact, there were some massacres carried out against the population when they wanted to be with the Muslims. Mm -hmm. uh, he joined hands with India. So India uh, imposed an indirect rule um, on the valley of Jammu and Kashmir, okay, which continued to this day on paper. Of course, uh, Kashmir has been the most heavily militarized region in the world. There is, uh, I mean, there are close to a million soldiers in Kashmir as we speak right wow. now. Okay, uh, okay, to subdue the valley, to have mm -hmm. control over it. And Pakistan wants it as part of Pakistan because it was claimed by Pakistan as well, right? So uh, Nehru promised when he took Kashmir as his own, mm -hmm. as if it was his, his own, uh, you know, to claim, uh, he promised that we will do a referendum for the population. If the population wants to uh, go independent from India and Pakistan, is, it would be their choice, or if they want to join mm. hands with Pakistan, then that referendum never happened, unfortunately, right? Mm. So Kashmir was given a special status, um, and the article that guaranteed that was the Article 370 in the Indian Constitution and 35A, right? Uh, according to these two articles... discussed at the moment, right? Yes, which is exactly what was uh, repealed uh, mm. yesterday. Was it yesterday or the day before? Yeah, On Monday on Monday. Mm. These two articles were repealed by the current extremist right-wing BJP Indian government. Okay, mm. uh, And they obviously didn't care about agreements made 
by previous governments and leaders. So these two articles guaranteed uh, the semi-autonomous status of the states of Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, so according to these articles, Indian civilians uh, from mainland India couldn't buy land in Kashmir. Yeah. Okay, the, the the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court of India did not did, didn't apply in Jammu and Kashmir. Okay, the people of Jammu and Kashmir could have their own flags. Okay, uh, they would have to consult the main uh, land. Uh, the, the Indian government on issues regarding uh, foreign policy, mm -hmm. defense, and things like that, security issues. Other than that, Kashmir was constitutionally a semi-autonomous region. So now they just this changed status, the constitution. Yeah, they changed. They abolished without any serious consultation, even with their own politicians, to impose a direct occupational rule over mm. the valley of Jammu and Kashmir. Mm. These two articles were completely repealed by the current Indian government, which is well known for the Indian parliament hatred didn't. against Muslims, mm. for pumping Islamophobia. All the lynchings in India that have been taking place for the last five years. Yeah, have I was just been, actually watching videos been, today yes. of how bad it is. Yeah, yeah, Muslims are being killed, uh, you know, like... Uh, like even like insects, basically, yeah. uh, uh, you know, if Hindu mobs get together and they, they decide to kill a Muslim or a Muslim family, uh, it's, it's all good. Police would be, uh, you know, reluctant to take action because a lot of the times police uh, th themselves, they sympathize with such mobs and they are, they are part of the, the, the problem. So Muslims are facing a very difficult period, generally speaking, in India. Yeah. Very, very difficult period. I mean... Recently, all these issues have been raised about the, uh, the triple talaq, as if Modi or the BJP mm. really <laughs> cares about the exactly. Indian women. And yeah. some of the Muslim leaders have been raising this point that if you yeah. really care about the rights of women, which is the pretext they are using to attack the Muslim community by mm. using uh, one of the clauses of yeah. the Hanafi fiqh, right? Um, and this is what the Muslim leaders have been speaking about in, in, in India, that don't think this is only a problem of the Hanafis. It is a problem for for the muslims because today they are attacking the hanafi fiqh tomorrow mm. they will attack all fiqh they will attack islam and this is the aim slowly make i'm, yeah, I'm talking about specifically this hard particular to, government it's hard not to question their sincerity about protecting exactly. women where they're being raped in mobs it, uh, exactly and exactly and on top of that hold on if you think about women's rights in india the the highest uh, rate of rapes in the world okay is in India, unfortunately. India is the rape capital of the world. Number yeah, one. Yeah. Number two, uh, the highest rate of female infanticide is in India. The yeah. highest number of uh, aborted female fetuses is yeah. in India. Mm -hmm. yeah. The highest number of child prostitution uh, mm. is in India. There are slums in India. Bombay, Bengal, you know, you know, I don't know where, I mean, you go and watch documentaries on YouTube and you will see mm. uh, what's happening to women in India. So it is ironic for the government to suddenly, the BJP government in particular, Very to suddenly wake yeah. up and start defending women's rights when it comes to Muslim, Muslim mm. women, right? And Modi tweeted about that, mm. that today, you know, there is something, freedom for women or something like that. So this is like Sarkozy, Right mm. uh, in in uh, I think not very long ago when in he France. was the president in France he said they are imposing this uh, mm. niqab ban to protect uh, <laughs> women yeah. against oppression. But hold on a second, France has a huge population of uh, trafficked women who are being mm. sold in markets. Mm -hmm. France has a huge problem with women. It seems like a normal kind of playbook to yeah. to um, to. To call to a, a crowd baying for kind of uh, the blood of a scapegoat, get angry at this kind of demonized population. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, whilst you continue to kind of increase your own powers as a government. Yes. And uh, distract people. And, and, and distracting people from real problems. So, so all coming, these... Coming back to Kashmir. Yeah, coming back to Kashmir. I mean, currently now, unfortunately, the situation is that India has imposed a direct rule over Kashmir. Mm. It's occupation now, basically. It's completely ignoring all the previous treaties and agreements and going against all the United Nations and the United Nations resolutions and and all the advice of uh, international leaders and requests from Pakistan and Kashmiri leaders mm. uh, and even Indian politicians within India Rahul Gandhi the leader of uh, Congress party which is one of the biggest parties in India has severely criticized this move and he has warned that this move will potentially divide India. 
Mm. And uh, big things may happen. It's a kind of global lurch to the right of many different um, uh, USA, uh, many different um, European uh, countries, uh, Israel, to India. The they right, they yeah. keep to be. F- they seem to be forming like a nexus of uh, further populist right wing kind of anti yes. Muslim anti immigration rhetoric. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. But like for the people of Kashmir, I don't know what this means. We have no idea what's going to happen to them. And mm. Indian Army is unfortunately known for committing atrocities in Kashmir. It is well documented. I'm not even making this up. Yeah. This is not because I'm speaking as a Muslim. My bias is speaking. There is documentary evidence of Indian Army committing atrocities against Kashmiri civilians. Okay, yeah. Thousands of people have disappeared. Thousands of rapes Okay, and other things. Right? So even the, the so world's largest... Um, population of preventable blindness yes. in Kashmir as well because wow. of the because of the pellets, the, the pellets. Yeah, what yeah, they yeah, euphemistically call pellet guns, which is just yeah. twelve gauge shotguns filled with yeah. uh, metal, yeah. five hundred, yeah. six hundred metal pellets. And I, I really wonder who is advising the Indian government or the military to do these kind of things because it doesn't but really bring any 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 peace to the to the. It wouldn't, but it would peace is not good for his, business. Yeah. Exactly. Unfortunately, unfortunately, sure. that's true. And, and you the know, Hindu community will rally yeah. against, uh, rally yeah. for yeah. their leadership when it comes to a, a tour for Pakistani Prime Minister today. He delivered a speech and he um, he warned the Indian government that if anything goes wrong in Kashmir now, uh, Pakistan is mm. not to blame. Uh, India or the Indian government will be to blame for any atrocities, any uh, uh, unpleasant events going. On in and we really hope for peace. We, as Muslim community around the world, we want the best for the people of Kashmir. We want the best for pe- the people of India. I mean, and a lot of people have been criticizing the Pakistani government or mm. Pakistani army mm. uh, or n- Pakistani nationalists, mm. kind of who say, you know, we have the, a very strong army, but I mean, why don't you do anything about? Why do you uh, protect the people in Kashmir? Yeah, I mean, okay, what's no, practically uh, what can they do? I don't think Can they, they, do they have the power to just move into Kashmir and start uh, start a war. They cannot finish. Mm. So Pakistan, because there's been several wars. How many? T- two or three wars yeah, in the past. Yeah, and, and they haven't done anything. So this is why the current prime minister Imran Khan, uh, and I don't agree with everything he says, but there are a few things he says are very very uh, noble. He has mm. clearly said to the Indian government that we are ready for peace. We want peace for our, both our nations. Mm. Uh, we should come together and work for the well-being of our people. Uh, India needs peace. Indian people deserve a better lifestyle. Pakistani people need a better lifestyle. And most importantly, the Kashmiris uh, uh, have the right to determine their future, right? So why don't we come to terms, sit down uh, and, have, and have a discussion? But it seems that the government on the other side doesn't want peace and they're doing things like this mm. and now there is direct occupation I really hope and pray that Kashmir doesn't become another Palestine I sure. really really hope and pray that there is a, a resolution but unfortunately facts on the ground uh, are telling another story do you think and, do yeah. you think this is what we're witnessing is the kind of the death pangs of the nation state model here and these types of uh, is is India too big to be a single kind of coherent state uh it is i mean i don't know um what to say on this but it is clear that uh, the indian government current the current government the, why i keep saying the current government it is ruled by a specific group of people mm. mm-hmm. and they are known for their bigotry they are yeah. known for their hatred towards muslims they are known for their hatred towards sikhs yeah. and dalits and uh, it, it is an e- it is an elite which doesn't seem to be caring about the people of india because of the kind, because of the kind of things they're doing, and uh, uh, if India had problems previously, what this government might end up doing is is c- completely escalating those problems out of control, right? And mm-hmm. it is very possible that our fears uh, about the region may uh, may come true. Uh, but we really hope for peace and justice for all people in mm-hmm. the world, whether it's Kashmiris or Indians, and uh, this world. Is getting so. In terms know. of the brothers and sisters watching the podcast and everyone out there, what can we do to get involved to do something for the? I, I advise Muslims around the world today to again not be, uh, you know, not have this knee-jerk attitude towards global politics. Rather, we need to have a long-term strategy, globally speaking. 
we need to have more people in journalism we need to have more people educated we need to have more people uh taking leadership around the globe whether it's politically economically um and you know uh, in other fields uh, that that mm-hmm. are important power shaping power making uh positions okay this is where we are lacking we have many intelligent people we have many doctors engineers mm-hmm. accountants we need more thinkers we need more politicians noble politicians right when you use the word politician uh people think it is a liar a hypocrite a deceiver <laughs> mm-hmm. okay mm-hmm. and uh, a number of people yeah. come to mind right yeah. okay and i don't want to mention the names right mm-hmm. but i'm mm-hmm. not talking about that i'm talking yeah. about politicians uh you know omar bin khattab right uh, abu bakr as-siddiq radhiyallahu an uthman and ali some of them were successful others were not but the point is we need to have nobility of character and when we show that nobility politically on the political scene the world can see that there is an alternative we don't have to elect uh, uh, people with yellow hair you know uh, we, we don't have to yeah, elect you don't have power. to they'll become okay. your uh, yeah, leaders yeah, anyway yeah i mean when i say yellow hair I, i don't have anything against yellow hair but there are you know mm. <laughs> the people i'm talking about right funny looking people with funny men, characters men the, um, yeah. with with little iq with little intelligence uh, we don't have to elect these people to power okay there mm. are other alter- we need to produce those alternatives so muslims need to take lead wherever they may be in these fields okay Uh, we blame the governments we blame uh, the middle eastern governments we blame our own governments wherever <coughs> they may be but the question is okay uh, you are just another man having popcorn sitting in front of the tv watching news and blaming 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 yeah. okay where's the solution the solution is in you get up wake up go to the university go and launch a youtube channel and start talking about politics and don't cause disasters and blunders i mean we don't we don't want ignorant people talking about mm. topics they have study educate yourselves really? get to know the world and talk yeah. about it and yeah, then so. you will become leaders inshallah mm, inshallah and also you know when the last the first 10 days of dhul hijjah so mm. make dua uh, imagine you know, all these millions of people in yes. hajj the hujjaj you know if absolutely you're, if you're watching i don't yeah. know why you're watching while you're in uh, ihram but it's not haram inshallah but if you're watching remember to make dua for brothers and sisters in kashmir palestine everywhere Rohingya, around the world yeah east turkestan everywhere Uh, subhanallah and before we end a very quick note that we as muslims we represent a civilization right we don't represent a particular ethnicity or a, or a particular language or a particular piece of land uh-huh. we represent a civilization it is a living civilization it started with the advent of the prophet of islam sallallahu alaihi wasallam it has a unique feature uh-huh. it has a unique character we represent that civilization we represent our poets our authors our libraries our hospitals our our street lights in cordoba we d- represent our philosophers in baghdad we represent our theologians in in damascus we represent our artists for example calligraphers in india we represent all of that islamic civilization is absolutely beautiful and this is what we need to highlight we need to show the world that you can't just jump from a bunch of extremists straight to the prophet and link them to the prophet no mm. if you want to talk about the prophet then you start talking about what took place between the, the 21st century and exactly the yeah. rich history of the muslim civilization or the islamic mm. civilization if you want to call that akhlaq khan collective like to, to the conversation yeah, very well. uh, interesting but unfortunately we have to wrap up zakum la khair brothers and sisters we have to take cash and land to uh, dinner have to take him to eat as well mashallah yeah. he's probably very hungry we'll take care of that now now you're stepping into our field of expertise <laughs> mashallah <laughs> okay uh zakum la khair brothers and sisters for watching and uh, listening please uh, give it a like and share if you're interested um, if you didn't like it then go easy on us we have very fragile egos Um you might have noticed we're also on iTunes um Google Play podcast wherever you get your podcast inshallah we should be now so please give it a you know um however you like it five stars whatever you know if you want uh, unless it's, it gives you the choice of 10 stars and go for that one but uh, yeah I've been your host Salman Bhatt this is Adil Rashid <laughs> Adil uh, Ali Adnan Rashid we'll get mixed up again but jazakallah uh, khair for joining jazakallah khair assalamu alaykum assalamu alaykum assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah Uh, uh, script.